Assalamu alaikum everyone. I hope you are having a very nice weekend. Uh, we all have had prayed our Salatul Juma, and it's very nice environment here in Dhaka. Um, so the calmness required for attending the session, very interesting one, I hope it would be, is here. Okay. Before I introduce our today's guest lecturer, I would like to um, I would like to talk a few minutes about how I got introduced to him. So I was taking it. It was um, I, I I was almost on the verge of graduating. I had this free required credits that I must uh, take in order to graduate. So eight humanities uh, credit. Um, four of them I had already transferred from Bangladesh University of Professionals. In the class that I took with uh, Wahidul Alon sir, who is also present here with us today. But I had to take another class worth four credits. I was a bit anxious because um, at that stage, I did not want to rock my GPA a lot. And also I was going through some personal troubles. So did not want a very tough course either. But on the other hand, I also wanted to learn uh, a few things within the area of my interest. So trying not to go beyond my area of interest, but trying to explore uh, in greater depth within my area of interest as well. And if you are a sincere student at the fourth year of your undergraduate studies, I think you will find that there are, not, there are not too much you can learn from taking a 100 level class. So I was not very sure what I would get um, from attending the class that I, I was, uh, I enrolled, uh, which was a class on um, famous thought arguments in philosophy. I believe the title was that, and I took it with Daniel. Um, but I sure was, uh, in for a ride. I studied classical liberalism in a way that I had never before. This is not to say that Daniel convinced me to accept that John Stuart Mill was right in all instances or that Adam Smith had no flaws, but the twists uh, using which they arrived at the conclusion that they did so it was obviously enlightening. Um, it is there where I studied uh, first time John Stuart Mill alongside um, Adam Smith and some other uh, thinkers that you, those of you who are in social science classes have already studied. And this session was already in the making for quite a long time, but we did not have uh, the free time and also the right opportunity. But thankfully now we are here today. So a few ground rules. So let's do away with the housekeeping thing first, get over with it. Please try to have your cameras on. Um, in this situation, um, we are, it's already a very difficult task to keep engaged, you know? Um, it's already online. We cannot attend offline classes or offline sessions, even if we want in many cases because of the pandemic. So please try to have your cameras on. It allows the participants as well as the, uh, as well as our distinguished uh, guest speaker to engage with one another. Um, okay, well, you still have to have your cameras on, but I hope as the session progresses, you will uh, you'll be doing that. Also, um, during the session, please keep yourself muted unless you are asked otherwise. Secondly, um, please do not ask question during the lecture. Obviously, we'll be having questions and that is why we have the Q&A session following the lecture. Uh, during the Q&A session, you are advised or required, basically, to type in your question first. 
send the question through uh, send the question to us through the chat box. Um, after that, we will ask you to uh, read the question aloud. So please do that. Um, so now, so this is basically the informal introduction to Daniel. I think um, he, he is a very informal person. I mean, it doesn't mean that he is not uh, demanding when it comes to academic stuff, but the approach that he takes to teaching and also, as well as to learning is very uh, informal and which is why it is so much interesting with him. Um, coming to the formal part, let me introduce you to Daniel. So Dr. Daniel Pellerin is an assistant professor in ethics, philosophy and economics at Mahadol University International College, MUIC. He has an authority on classical liberalism. Dr. Pellerin earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in politics, philosophy and economics from the University of Oxford before getting a master's degree in political science from University of California, Los Angeles. He then did his PhD coursework at Newark University, but eventually received his degree in political science, political theory track from the University of Toronto. Before joining MUIC, Dr. Pellerin has taught at McMaster University, National University of Singapore in US, Royal University of Bhutan, Chulalongkorn University, and Srinakarni, Srina Karin Wirat University. He has also been a visiting professor at University of Saskatchewan, University of Redlands, University of California, Davis, Colgate University, and Thomas Hooks University. And also let me share you a tidbit here. Um, as I was searching Daniel online, I came to know that when he departed anyways for Colgate, there was a huge uproar amongst the students, current and former, uh, who demanded that Daniel be retained at anyways. Um, you can still look up uh, all the students demanding that their favorite teacher uh, stays um, online. Yeah. So without further ado, I would uh, like to invite Daniel. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ishak, for that very kind uh, and generous introduction. So. Um, I suppose you know the way I'm showing up here with my tie doesn't make me look um, doesn't make me look terribly informal, but um, I think it's fair to say that uh, I am uh, more informal than I may seem. But um, you know, for an honor like this to get the chance to address you all, I did uh, find that I should dress up a little bit. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very excited to be here, and uh, I'll salam alaikum to you all. Now. Um, Ishak was generous enough to introduce me as an authority on classical liberalism. I probably wouldn't go. That far, I would prefer to say that uh, I'm a student and an, an admirer of that tradition, which I find very rich and nuanced, but it's one of the hallmarks of the liberal way of thinking, at thing, thinking of things that you would really never see in anyone um, an authority of the sort where somebody's expected to be right in all respects, let alone that there's no flaws in uh, his thinking. So um, certainly that's true also of um, Smith and Mill. They were fallible. Um, thinkers to be sure, but they were very insightful to my mind. And so I'm delighted to get a chance to talk to you today about uh, Mill's approach to um, to freedom of thought and discussion, because it is one of my favorite pieces of, um, of writing in all of political philosophy. I, I hope that the chapter I passed to Ishraq has made its way to you too, or th to those of you who, who are interested in reading it. Um, and um, I do think it is something that is a matter of universal concern in the world, and that is under considerable pressure, not just today, but pretty much at all times. It's a very um, rare and I think very noble ideal that uh, Mill defines in that chapter, and I'm going to try to make it plausible to you, um, which is not to say that I think it is right in all respects, and I don't think Mill would want of, want for us to conclude that either. He is not somebody, he's not a prophet who is laying down the law in any way, he is a political thinker who would welcome um, intelligent disagreement very much. And in many ways, that's what his argument is about. All right. So let me, before I get, before I start getting into what I think Mill's argument um, involves and implies, let me maybe start by saying what it is not. Um, you may be used, or we're all, I think, used to um, freedom, of, freedom of speech arguments that proceed from somebody's right to, to say something or to be heard. And I think it's quite important that in Mill, um, the argument doesn't stress that, actually. It doesn't depend on the speaker's right. It depends on the interest that we all have in what he 
has to say to us. All right. Now that may it may it may seem that that's um, that that pretty much comes to the same thing, but it has it has important implications. Uh, Mill's not, Mill is of course concerned with the law too, right? The law that would say um, you have a right to speak, and that was very much part of the British intellectual tradition at the time, and despite some challenges, remains so today. Um, but I think he goes quite a bit beyond that. His concern is much bigger than than just the law. Um, he's not just he's not just presenting um, a debating point here, but he's expressing a deep conviction, and I think that conviction is about our our urgent interest as thinking and reasoning creatures and getting to hear as wide a range of opinions as possible. And that's on the understanding that many of those opinions will not be very pleasing to us, that they will sound far-fetched, that they may seem wrong-headed, and that they may even appear pernicious to us in many cases. All right. Um, and yet, despite all of this, uh, Mill deploys the full range of his powers, you know, head, heart, and pen to convince us that it is entirely illegitimate and also unwise for that timeless sensor that we have in all of us, that little voice that says you are wrong and therefore I do not need to listen to you, to indulge that, right? That little voice is to his mind dangerous. It always thinks it knows enough, not only to dismiss an opinion, but to shut it down for everybody else as well by suppressing it. We all have that instinct in us and it needs to be fought tooth and nail in Mill's opinion. And that's what my argument here about his thought is going to be about. It's about more than legal punishment. It's about social pressures. It's about our tendency to stigmatize and discredit. It's about our inclination to attack somebody's livelihood if we cannot get at him or her any other way. And it is even about the melancholy dynamic of self-censorship, all right? In Mill view, if you silence a dissenting voice, you rob mankind, that's on page 19. There's a loss. It is always something precious. And now we can talk about that. That is a, very, is a debatable position, but I will try to make that plausible to you to show you why that is not as far-fetched as it may seem. But it is very radical, and I want to stress that right at the outset. We should not think, we should not be too quick to think that we're with the program if this sounds reasonable. Um, it is very demanding. It's a very demanding standard because it means more than just tolerating someone on the assumption that we already know better. You know, I'll let you talk as a devil's advocate, but I already know the answer anyway. That's not enough, right? It's about cultivating a particular attitude towards those who disagree with you. And that attitude is very difficult to sustain, which, I don't, which is why I don't think it's ever really been at home anywhere for too long. It is very difficult to maintain. Uh, and that attitude is one of being open at all times to the possibility that we are wrong, even on the fundamentals, even when we feel most self-assured and most confident that we've got it and that we always, that there's always a good chance that we may have something to learn, even from those whom we disagree with most, whom we may even despise on occasion uh, and about matters about which we care most. That is the position that I take Mill to be presenting and I'm going to try to make that I'm going to try to review how he gets to that point and then um, you know show you what follows from it and we can discuss some of the implications in the questions and answers all right so let me review first of all how he gets to this for those of you who who are not familiar with the chapter so he's got he makes this argument in four different ways um, and the first one is the element of human fallibility all right Given what we so readily recognize in others, in other ages, in other cultures, in other people, how easy it is to be wrong, how can we escape the conclusion that there's always a good chance that we are as wrong as they appear to us? And that's point one. All right. Now, it's not that we have a problem recognizing how fallible the human mind is, how easily we can go wrong. Right. We look to the past, at least many people do, and we see ages of barbarism and darkness. Now, that may be a bit more Western. I know in um, you know, Islamic culture, there's a bit more, more of a tendency to look back and see a golden age. But for the most part, Westerners don't see that. They see um, an age that was backward and, um, you know, the great progress that they think they have made. We look to the superstitions or the idol worship of others with horror and derision. And we have a hard time even understanding how anybody could believe something so absurd. Right. We look at our neighbors and our compatriots, and we often wonder how they can be such fools. We all recognize that, right? So at that level, we have no trouble 
uh, we have no trouble seeing how fallible the, the human mind is, but we don't bother applying that to ourselves, all right? We just don't draw that inference that if others appear that mistaken to, that mistaken to us, you know, then maybe we are not going to be the only ones who can escape from it. Maybe we are caught in that same predicament and maybe we need to be prepared that whatever, whatever position we may take, we are just as, we are just as misgu misguided as they are at all times, all right? Now, even if we accept that that's true and we include ourselves um, in principle, I mean, of course, there are times when we will look at the arguments of others and we will say this just doesn't make any sense. And when we don't feel obliged to take it very seriously, and that's fine, right? We, we have that prerogative and Mill does not challenge that. But if you are going to shut somebody up, you are, you are saying something a lot more than that. You're not just saying this is not for me. You're not just saying, I'm not sure I have anything to learn from this. You are saying there is nothing of value here for anybody. And that is a very different proposition, All right? So to put this in Mill's words, um, this is on page 25 for anybody who wants to follow along. It is not the feeling sure of a doctrine that I call an assumption of infallibility. It is the undertaking to decide that question for others without, uh, without allowing them to hear what can be said on the contrary side. And I denounce this pretension no less when put forth on the side of my most solemn convictions. All right, it doesn't matter how much I agree with this position. As soon as it is used to shut somebody down, it loses its legitimacy. All right, now, of course, um, again, we may admit that, but then there are those times when we feel particularly sure of our position. And our age is no different from any other in that respect. You know, when we, when we look at what others are arguing and what they believe, and it looks not just wrong to us, it looks immoral, it looks impious, it looks dangerous, right? That is when we are most certain. And you would think that those are the times when it is most excusable for us um, to come down hard on the other position, but that is not Mill's conclusion. Mill's conclusion is just the opposite. Mill would say it's precisely when we are most certain of ourselves, because we are so sure that we've got, that we are representing, you know, the moral side of the question, that we are on the side of piety, that we are on the side of righteousness, that's when the worst mistakes get made, all right? And he looks back at history and he looks at cases like um, the trials of um, Socrates or, or of Jesus, which of course to his, to his audience would have been particularly salient. Um, he looks to St. Paul, who before he became um, the organizer of the Christian church had hunted Christians wherever he could find them and who had his conversion experience, as you may know, on the road to Damascus, because in Jerusalem, he'd, he'd run out of Christians to hunt down, right? He thinks of Marcus Aurelius, who is celebrated as one of the great philosopher, philosopher kings of history, who was a persecutor of the Christians. And of course, Mill at the time is addressing an audience of Christians largely. Um, and so he concludes from this, you know, when, when we are most certain that it, ours is the, the only credible moral position, then we, we ought to be most careful. Um, and I quote him again from page 28, unless anyone flatters himself a wiser and better man than Marcus Aurelius, let him abstain from the assumption of the joint infallibility of himself and the multitude. So it is when you agree with the crowd and when they roar their approval and when you cannot even imagine that you could be wrong on this, that you need to be most careful. That is, in, that is fallibility and it, um, it is a very large part of the argument, number one, but it's not the whole. Now, number two, Let's assume that you probably do have it right. So it's not so much that um, it's not so much that there is any doubt. It's not so much that um, you know I, I might be inclined to doubt that you're right. But how can you be so sure? What is the foundation of your certainty? All right. And what Mill would say there is it's precisely because you have exposed your arguments, your position to the criticism of others, because you've given them the opportunity to oppose it with full force that you can actually, that you can, that you can be at least reasonably sure that you've got it right. Um, now, that looks to me a bit like um, Popperian falsification, right? You may be aware of Karl Popper's theory of what we have warrant for, right? What makes our position valid um, beyond the usual mode, right? The usual mode is, um, well, of course it's valid. I feel it to be, it's so strongly felt. I feel that it's right. And others around me agree, so therefore it must be right. Well, that's not Popper and that's not Mill. Mill would say, no, it's just the opposite, the opposite way. You know, the con these confirmations you get from your feelings or from other people's opinions don't mean a whole lot. If you want to be sure of your position, the only, the, only, the only real foundation you have for it 
is to expose it to the opposite. Expose it to criticism. Try to take it down. See whether it will stand. You know, this is the equivalent of the scientific method. You know, set up your hypothesis. Try to disprove it. Um, let other give others a chance to disprove it. And if they cannot take it, if they can take it down, there it goes. But if it was if it withstands those attacks, well, then you've got some reason to believe that is more than just your personal perspective, or more than this tribal this tribal truth that we all feel to be so certain when it's really nothing but something we share with others. So this is page 21, 23. Complete liberty of contradicting and disproving our opinion is the very condition that justifies us in assuming its truth. On no other terms can we have any rational assurance of being right. And then a few lines further on, the beliefs we have most warned for have no safeguard to rest on, but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded, to prove them unfounded. I want to repeat that when I like that particularly. The beliefs we have most worn for have no safeguard to rest on, but a standing invitation to the whole world to prove them unfounded. That's what makes them, that's what gives us reason to believe in them. We're open to challenge um, and they can withstand it. All right. Now, notice if you really take this seriously, notice what world you live in. Suddenly it's a world where the certainties that we all crave so much have disappeared. You know, now you have provisional conclusions. Now you have hypotheses, um, but you never know um, when they might be, when they might fall, right? And so it's very natural that we resist this. You know, notice here how different is from the, this is from the normal mode. The normal mode is, you know, we crave certainty so much. We start with our beliefs. We have reasons for believing them that have nothing to do with, with, with rational evaluation. Um, we believe them for all kinds of emotional reasons. And then we, then we set out you know, to confirm them. And we look for pieces out there, pieces of evidence that fit. And what do we do with the stuff that doesn't fit? Do we seek it out? Of course not, right? If it comes our way and we cannot resist it, you know, we, we'd, rather, we'd rather throw it out. We'd rather fit the evidence to what we already believe than the other way around. So the way we normally go about this is the exact opposite. Um, but that is, not, that is not philosophy. That is not um, the kind of rational certainty that we can arrive at. That is the default mode. The default mode is not very philosophical and the default mode, mode is not for Mill. So that was point two. How can you be sure? Unless everything you say is open to challenge, but has not been, has not been, um, has not been taken down. All right. Then number three, and this is where it gets even more, this is where it gets even more, um, more subtle. Let's say that the opinion you have rejected is indeed false for the most part. Uh, Mill would remind us that progress doesn't work that way. You know, insight doesn't work that way where you have error and it gets completely displaced by the truth. Um, he has this image of, um, of it working a lot more like, uh, working a lot more in layers, right? So progress, this is from page 46. Um, in the human mind, one-sidedness has always been the rule and many-sidedness the exception. Hence, even progress, which ought to super add, for the most part, only substitutes one partial and incomplete truth for another. Such being the partial character of prevailing opinions, even when resting on true foundations, every opinion which embodies somewhat of the portion of truth which the common opinion admit, admits ought to be considered precious with whatever amount of error and confusion that truth may be blended. In other words, when we progress, it's not really, it, we, we like to tell ourselves that we have left all all the, the bad stuff behind now, that our position is now better than what we had before in every respect. And Mill says it just doesn't work that way. When we progress, what happens is we substitute one set of truths for another. And the new set may be better, but it leaves things out. It is never complete. And so, you know, I may find that your position on the whole is completely untenable, but that is not to say that there's not elements in it that I may need, in fact, that are neglected. Um, maybe elements of an old truth that we're now overlooking because it looks, it, looks, it, le it looks superseded to us. And so, you know, even though your position is predominantly wrong and mine is almost entirely right, there's always the possibility of that little piece of it that you, that you might be able to put to use, that you are missing, that you are neglecting in this confidence that you have that your position is the better one. All right, and then finally, and um, the, the layer that uh, maybe is least intuitive of all, number four, 
let's say I could, can, I could dismiss your position as completely false. So there's nothing to it. Um, it is simply an error. Still, it can, it can serve a vital function. How does it do that? Well, according to Mill, because it keeps us on our toes, right? Both teachers and learners, he, say that's, he says that's page 42, go to sleep at their posts as soon as there is no enemy in the field. This is the problem of political creeds, religious creeds going complacent, um, turning dogmatic and losing their live essence. They're no longer being challenged. They're now established. You don't have to fight for it anymore. There's no more struggle. You're in the certainty. You hold it in the certainty that's the truth and it goes dead, says Mill. It gets stale. It no longer has that power, that, that, that vitality of a lived truth, of something you had to defend, of something you had to struggle for. Um, it, is now just, um, it is now just a belief that is taken to be certain and that gets passed along. And you no longer have to think about it. All right. Now, of course, it's true, uh, Mill would say, that over time, societies may indeed advance and they may agree on more things. So a consensus may emerge. And that consensus is a good thing. We can agree with each other on certain truths. Fine. Um, but we should, not, we should bear in mind that that may not be all to the better. Right? We may lose some things along the way. And one of the things he thinks we will lose is we lose those dissidents often you know, who, who, who took the other case and who kept us on our toes. Um, and Mill thinks that the loss of those, those challengers is such a serious matter that if they no longer present themselves spontaneously, if we can no longer count on them being there as a matter of course, um, we should, he, this is, sounds like a joke, but he's quite serious about this. We should set them up deliberately. You know, we should do what the Catholic Church does in its appointment process for saints, appoint a devil's advocate. So, you know, you make the case against this, this possible saint. You say everything that could possibly be said against him, um, just to make sure, right? And so he says, um, if we could no longer find these dissidents, we would have to invent them. And how, and how um, what a loss it is. Um, if, if uh, they are still presenting themselves and we don't let them speak, All right? This is page 45. That which is so indispensable yet so difficult to create when absent, how much more than absurd it is to forego when it is spontaneously offering itself. And uh, here's one of the more remarkable lines in the text. Let us be thankful. Let us open our minds and rejoice that there is someone to do it for us. In other words, to challenge us. Those are the four layers, but I think it's safe to say that is not how we normally respond to people who challenge us, right? By being thankful, by rejoicing. That's not what we do. What we do um, is we look for, we want, we want our adversaries to be weak. We don't want them to be strong. And why is that? Well, because we want to be right, right? We care about losing. We care about losing probably more than anything else, even an argument. And so we are not, for the most part, going to be looking for strong adversaries for our match, you know, for the best, for the best debating partners we can find, you know, for the toughest, for the toughest opponents. You know, we want them easy. But think of what that implies. You know, think of what that implies, even in a, in a, in a game where everything is about winning. And life is not about that. But let's, let's imagine ourselves. Let's imagine a game like tennis. It's all about winning or chess. Um, your game can only be as good as the other guy, right? You cannot play a great game of tennis against a weak opponent. You cannot play a great game of chess against a weak opponent either. You know, even in something like war, where you, where you would think it's all war, you cannot win any glory against an enemy who's not serious. But in our thinking, we don't apply that same principle, right? And that is odd because in the intellectual realm, there is a huge distinction with the others. You know, in chess or in, in tennis or in war, you're out to win. You know, there's no, there's no switching sides. You fight on your side and if it's over, it's over. But intellectual combat, if you want to call it, that doesn't work that way. It doesn't matter on whose argument you get to the truth. If you get defeated, you always have the option of running with the other side and there's nothing dishonorable in that. So you get it, really the, the logic is even stronger, right? Number one, you can only be as right, you can only be as confident of yourself as your, opposite, as your opponent is. You cannot, you, cannot, you, cannot, um, you cannot play a great game intellectually if you do not have great opponents, number one. And number two, if you do, if you do get defeated, you can, you can join them. 
no loss, right? But that is not what we do. You know, what we do is we get afraid and we, we, um, we, get, we get afraid that the, wrong, that the wrong side wins. And that is understandable, right? Because the intellect is very fallible and it is very liable to be led astray. And Mill would be the first person to say that. But the big problem is, and it's not the case that the right side always wins. The right side in human affairs very often loses. That's all very true. But the trouble is, you know, how do you even know what the right side is? And we have two, cho we have two choices of establishing that, basically. One is the way of the philosophers and of the mills. And in the way of the philosophers, you have some kind of intellectual contest, some kind of dialectical method, some process of arguing with each other and learning from each other um, and somehow approximating the truth that way. And even then, it's a very fallible, it's a very, um, it's a very iffy process not to be counted on. But what's the alternative? What's if we don't, what, what happens if we don't follow that path? What happens if we go by the, the default human mode? That I am right and you are wrong and therefore you must shut up. What happens then? Well, then sooner or later, you know, we build our little communities, our little islands uh, in which we feel certain, but we all disagree with each other. We don't have to listen. You know, we try to, we try to, uh, we try to live with each other as best we can. But when it comes to the crunch, we fight it out. And then we don't fight it out by, by argument. Then we don't learn from each other. You know, then we just have a test of strength and that's it. And we all know that very well. All right. Now, what is new in all of this? You might say, well, yes, there's not, none, of this is, none of this is particularly new and you'd be, you'd be right. You know, I don't need to tell you about uh, murderous religious intolerance in our world. We're all only too aware. I don't need to tell you about how ready believers and political ideology have always been to bash each other's heads in over the finer points of their se secular theologies. I don't need to remind you how the powers that be, whether it's in Bangladesh, whether it's anywhere else, um, always do what they can to, to silence uncomfortable criticism. And I hope I don't need to remind you either that all of us in our hearts have this little sensor that I have talked about, the little voice that says, I am right, and you are wrong and therefore shut up, right? None of this is new. But I think there is something new on the, there is something new on the scene um, that looks even worse. And may, maybe in those first four respects, who knows, maybe the world looks a little bit better even than, than Mills. Hard to say, but possible. But there's one respect in which our world has changed um, that I think would shock uh, Mill very much. And I don't want to get into that um, for too long, but I want to at least mention it, and I'm sure some of you are going to pick, pick up on that in your questions. Um, and that new feature of our world that I think runs directly counter to everything that Mill believes in and presents in this chapter is that um, over the past 30 years or so, you know, our Western universities of all places have become hot, hotbeds of a political program um, that actually starts from the idea that you can tell others what they are expected and obliged to say that you can prescribe to others the language they may use you know down to the um down to the terms that they must use however loaded incoherent or ugly they may be um down to what pronouns they have to they have to use whether it violates the fundamentals of grammatical logic or even established usage um that is a very common trend um in our world and it is from a million point from a million point very troubling very troubling indeed, because it strikes at the very, at the very root of this ethos um, of letting others speak their minds, listening to them, engaging them in argument, and never ever telling them how they have to speak or what they may think. And yet for some reason, well, we could get into the reasons for this. And yet in our world, we are certainly seeing some very troubling movements in a different direction, maybe an opposite direction. And they, they are coming from the very heartland. Um, they are coming from exactly where I earn my living and where I do my bit um, as best I can. They come from the Western University and Mill would be horrified by this. There is no doubt. Um, now, what is so worrisome about situations where this very fundamental, in Mill's view and in mine, this very fundamental freedom um, to, to speak and this very fundamental attitude of listening to what others have to say, what happens when that falls by the wayside? What happens when that gets challenged, when that, get, when that is no longer something you can count on? And it doesn't matter whether the threat comes from the religious side or it comes from the political side or it comes from the academic side. What happens? Well, when that happens, there are three strategies 
for the people that are affected by it. And I just want to quickly run through them um, in both their more personal um, costs and in the costs for a society. The first one is, um, that's the most common, when you face these demands to comply to a particular protocol of what you are expected to believe and what you may say, the first strategy is you comply. Now, of course, you're not going to believe it entirely, right? But maybe you are broadly sympathetic. And so, you know, you fit what you can with these required categories and you dissemble the rest, meaning you shut up, meaning you, you hide it, you pretend it's not there. Now, I don't need to tell you the, the indignity of this, right? So here you are um, having to go along with something that you don't believe um, out of unease. So on the, on the individual side, the, 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 the dishonesty and sort of the implied cowardice of this is already bad enough, but there's a big cost for the society too, because now you, you get the impression that you know, the consensus is much bigger than it is. You would think, oh, you know, people are actually on board with this, but no. So many of them are not on board, but they're hiding. They're hiding partly, and it's in some ways even worse, you know, because they they go along outwardly, you know, they play the game, they use the categories, they speak the language, um, and so you would get the impression, oh, he too, he's with them as well, um, he believes this, um, when that's not maybe even true, but they do it to to keep themselves safe, and that's how human beings are, you know, you don't need to punish them, you don't need to, you don't need to hang them from uh, from the lampposts, you just need to you just need to make them. Um, just make, need to make them afraid, you know, afraid for their social position, afraid for their livelihoods, and they will do this. Position one, strategy one. Now, then you have strategy two. Strategy two is not quite as undignified, but has its own problems. Strategy, strategy two was recommended by Plato under the impression of his teacher, Socrates, being put to death, of all things, for blaspheming the gods and corrupting the young when he had, in Plato's mind, you know, done more than anyone else to um, to educate that youth to a higher standard, yet he is the one who has to drink the hemlock. Well, Plato drew some very drastic lessons from this, and his lesson was, well, if you want to be a philosopher, don't do it in public. So in this case, if you want to apply that to the contemporary academy, you don't play the game, but you withdraw. So you don't, uh, and an, an academic life gives you plenty of opportunities, right? You withdraw into your little niche, you do your research, you keep your head down, you hide in Plato's terms under a small wall, um, and maybe you know you confide in in some trusted students, and that's enough. Strategy two: Where's the cost? Well, the individual probably does better by that than number one, and then by one because it's less dishonest. But uh, society loses even more because now you know those who have other things to say, whom you need to for these debates to have real balance, they are not speaking; they're in hiding; they are boycotting the show. Well, and then there's strategy three, where you come out for what you believe and you fight the good fight. Um, and that one is by, all, is by all accounts the most noble one and from Mill's point of view, no doubt the most valuable, um, but this too comes with, a huge, comes with a huge price tag, right? I mean, even if you succeed, and there are such characters, you know, if you're, even if you're one of our contemporary dissidents, um, let's say, I don't know, Jordan Peterson with his 500 million, uh, 500 million watchers on, on YouTube, it takes a toll because, you know, when he's at home at, at the University of Toronto, he's not the big star, you know, then every, then he gets shunned, basically. And that is hard, right? And Socrates observes on this, even makes, a, makes an observation on this. He says in the Apology, you know, I, I felt I was getting unpopular by what I was doing. And it's hard. It's hard for a human being to lose, you know, that kind of support and to get, get more and more isolated um, by your efforts. And so this position number three, although, you know, it's more dignified, is the toughest one of all. Um, and not many of us are ready to pay that price. Um, from a societal point of view, it's fine. You know, you have somebody who actually fights for his beliefs and pays the price. Um, that is probably the most salutary, the most impressive, the most impressive uh, example of all. So from a societal point of view, we don't lose much. But, you know, we, what are we doing to, to our most courageous individuals? What kind of position are we putting them in when they have to martyr themselves in this way, you know, or lose or lose the respect of their peers, um, you know, and in the process, I don't know, get sick, as usually happens, or whatever it is, crack in some other way, right? Um, so that's the third one, third strategy. Um, 
there's also a kind of side comment. You know, it's not even clear that when we try to root out opinions this way, and you know, Western world is a good example of this. You know, we know what the great evils are. You know, uh, was it racism, sexism, you know, intolerance of sexual orientation? What happens when these positions can no longer speak out? You know, what happens when they're no longer socially acceptable? What happens when there's an elaborate protocol where you can't say anything that might suggest you don't agree with the orthodoxy? Do these opinions go away? You know, do your real say racists disappear? Do your hardened sexists disappear? You know, do your real do your real gay bashers disappear? No, they don't disappear. And they don't even have to argue their case because there's no more public debate of these things. They go underground. And now what do you do? You know, you've, you've, followed, this, you've followed this protocol in the name of, of rooting them out. But now they're in hiding. Now their positions don't actually get debated openly anymore because everybody's afraid. And now why would they change their mind? They're not getting challenged. They're in their niches. And instead of rooting it out, what you've really done is you've driven it, you've driven it deeper in. That's a big danger that those who think they can, um, that, they can, uh, that they can squeeze out dissent somehow never think of. You know, dissent that you push doesn't go away. It goes underground and you can't get at it anymore. And it festers and it gets worse, if anything. All right. So um, before, I, before I put you all to sleep here with what I have to say, I'm almost done. I'll just give you a, a little bit of the flavor. Those of you who have not read Mill, let me give you a little bit of a flavor. One last paragraph where maybe um, you'll get a sense of why, you know, Mill excites me and might be, might be a little, bit tricky for you to follow that because in, you know, it is very written English. And so maybe as it's read out, it doesn't work quite the same way. But let me give you a passage from pages 34, 33 to 34 on social intolerance and its effects. When, once I've read that for you, then um, I'm done and we can, we can discuss this point by point. All right, so this is Mill, in Mill's words, a little bit uh, longer, about 10 lines or so. Our merely social intolerance, he says, kills no one, roots out no opinions, but it induces men to disguise them. With us, and he's talking about Britain in the 19th century, it's the same with us today. With us, at least in the West, with us, heretical opinions never blaze out far and wide, but continue to smolder in the narrow circles of thinking where they originate. And thus has kept up a state of things very satisfactory to some minds. Because without the unpleasantness of fining or imprisoning anybody, all prevailing opinions are maintained outwardly and disturbed, undisturbed, while the exercise of reason by dissidents, dissidents afflicted with the malady of thought, is not openly prohibited. So you're not fining, you're not imprisoning, you're not even banning anything, um, but nobody speaks. A convenient plan for having peace in the intellectual world. But the price paid for this sort of intellectual pacification is, is the sacrifice of the entire moral courage of the human mind. A state of things in which a large portion of the most active and inquiring intellects find it advisable to keep the general principles and grounds of their convictions to themselves and attempt in what they address to the public to fit as much as they can of their own conclusions to premises they have, inward, they have, internal, they have inwardly renounced cannot send forth the open, fearless characters and logical, consistent intellects that once adorned the thinking world. The sort of men who can be looked for under it are either mere conformers to commonplace or time servers for truth, whose arguments on all great subjects are meant for their hearers and are not those which have convinced themselves. While that which would strengthen and enlarge men's minds, free and daring speculation on the highest subjects is abandoned. That's it. And I am open for questions.